Okay. So uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for logging on to witness Emily Pierce's thesis defense. And Emily, I know this is not exactly how we pictured your defense would be when you arrived here at Moss Landing, but um, thank you so much for um, your adaptability and flexibility and, and just your good cheer as we got into this day. Um, just to everyone out there, I just um, personally like to wish you all well. Hope you're you're doing okay during this period. I know that it's that it's difficult, um, but everyone at the lab um, is really wanting you to um, to get through this well. And um, we're just looking forward to the time when we can all be back here at the laboratory and just getting about business as usual. So, um, so I'll, I'd like to just take a couple of minutes to introduce Emily and then turn over the lectern. Um, Emily got here in 2017 after completing a bachelor's degree at Pepperdine University, where she did um, research with faculty on, um, on Grunion beach spawning and, uh, and also on plant pathology. Um, both projects have resulted in publications, so she already has two to her credit. Um, at Moss Landing, she's been, I would say, hyper-involved um, in the life of the lab. Um, she's just volunteered for everything that's possible to volunteer for. She's been the student body president. Um, she's participated in all sorts of outreach things, like besides just fully engaging in our open house. Whenever there's an opportunity to go represent the Invert Lab at, a, at an ocean exploration sort of thing, she's, she's always there to do it. Um, she's won numerous um, awards at Moss Landing, um, including a, a Coast Research uh, Fellowship, the Bill Watson Scholarship, a WAVE Award, um, she's had an award from the CSUMB UROC program where she oversaw um, a undergrad to help her with her research. And she's also um, this year's uh, recipient of the John Martin Scholarship, which is um, the most prestigious of the student scholarships. So congratulations, Emily, for, for all of those accomplishments. Um, she's been a, a just a wonderful person to have in the lab. Um, just probably one of the most upbeat persons I've ever met. And um, that, that's always been appreciated. She's um, been working for me as a research assistant and that's been very appreciated. And, um, and now she's here to tell you the results of her research. Um, on eDNA, um, and when she finishes in, in total, has submitted her thesis and we've sent her off, she'll be, she'll be starting a PhD program um, at the University of, of Maine. Um, also, well, she will continue her studies on eDNA in a NSF-sponsored project there. So with that, um, I'll welcome Emily to the, um, to the lectern here to present her thesis, Quantifying the Emanation and Decay of Environmental DNA from Three Marine Mollusks. Thanks, John. <laughs> so hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning into my thesis defense today. I know that there are a lot of other places you could be and other people you could be seeing, haha. <laughs> um, but I'm glad that you are here today with me. Before I get started, I wanted to thank everyone at Moss Landing, um, especially Jocelyn, Jim, and the IT crew for getting me set up with my defense um, as my Wi-Fi at home is not great. So thank you so much for your help and let's jump into the research. So what did we do? There we go. So I'm gonna start with a little roadmap so you can ex uh, see what you're gonna expect throughout my presentation. We'll start with the introduction so I can go over the definitions and significance of the study. 
Then we'll move into methods. We'll talk about the molecular techniques that I used, my experimental design, and why I chose to do those things. Then we'll move on to the results so I can show you um, the data that I came up with in accordance with the different hypotheses. We'll move into the discussion to tie everything together and talk about the implications of the research. And lastly, we'll go over a little bit of modeling so that you can see how this data might be able to be used to show how eDNA moves in a near shore ecosystem in the ocean. So starting off, what is DNA? DNA is the molecular code of life. It's what makes my hair brown, my dad's hair black, and the reason for that is because DNA is different for different individuals. My hair is brown because that's what my DNA says it should be. My dad's hair is black because of the DNA. And if you take it back to your intro to biology class and remember the mnemonic, uh, like Dear King Philip, come out for goodness sake to learn about the different classifications that scientists use to talk about uh, different animals, DNA becomes more different when we're looking at different species, different families, different phylums. So the more further away that organisms are in the tree of life, the more different their genetic information is going to be. Scientists can use this to our advantage to actually look into specific parts of the genome and look at where these differences are coming from. For example, if we just look at all of the invertebrates, we know that they are different, right? A sponge is very different than a sea star, but they do have slight similarities in that none of these individuals have a backbone, none of them have bones in general. But then if we just look at one phylum, the mollusks, they're more similar, but still slightly different. So the sea slug on the left doesn't have a shell, whereas the snail does. And it would be fine if we wanted to go through and look at the entire genome to actually see where these differences are, but that would take us a lot of time and money. So we can use the fact that some parts of the genome evolve at different rates to our advantage. One of those regions is the CO1 or cytochrome C oxidase region of the mitochondrial genome which evolves at such a fast rate that we can use it to tell the difference between closely related species. If we just want to look at this region, this commonly, genetic used bar, commonly used genetic barcode, we can use something called primers, which are small pieces of DNA that can be used to isolate just that region of the genome. So that again, we don't have to go sorting through the entire genome to look for the differences between closely related species. So when I started my time here at Moss Landing and wanted to decide what I was going to do for my thesis, this term environmental DNA kept coming up. And it was something I was really interested in. So like any good Moss Landing Marine Laboratory student, I went to one of our library's wonderful databases and searched eDNA, the short for environmental DNA, and came up with a lot of results that I wasn't exactly expecting, um, including just like my nanny, troubling teachers' social identities in the classroom, something about polymerization and bundling of actin, and this was not what I expected for environmental DNA. But then I realized, oh, the library databases don't care about capitalization, so this pulled up papers by anybody named Edna. Edna. So Edna became kind of the bane of my existence during my thesis, um, but it is kind of something I look back on with fondness now. So what environmental DNA actually is, is it's DNA released into the water, air, soil, and ice by all organisms and it can persist in cells, mucus, waste, pretty much anything that comes off of the body of the organism. And it can exist inside of a cell, so intracellularly, or outside of a cell, extracellularly. And the cool thing about environmental DNA is previously, when we wanted to get genetic information from organisms, we would need to either sacrifice the animal or take a clipping of their tissue, which is harmful. Um, so the cool thing about environmental DNA is it's non-invasive. We don't even have to touch the animal to get this genetic information. So far, eDNA has been used in a variety of different research projects. I'm gonna show you some of the examples on land and in lentic and lodic systems first. Um, so first, eDNA has been found in permafrost in ice in low levels. Specifically, scientists have used this to find eDNA of ancient horses and woolly mammoths. eDNA also exists in sediments um, where they found that aquatic sediments held higher eDNA concentrations than water in lakes and rivers. And lastly, and probably my favorite application of eDNA thus far, is a citizen science project that they did in the UK, where they trained volunteers for about 30 minutes and sent them out to collect water samples in various ponds and found that they were able to find the habitat of a rare newt better with environmental DNA than just visual surveys alone. In the ocean, eDNA has also been used, um, specifically in this study looking at fish where they compared eDNA abundances to deep water fish trawl data and one study where they used eDNA and compared it to acoustic monitoring data to find harbor porpoises in the northern oceans. But there's kind of a disconnect. There are a lot of different organisms that live in the ocean and a lot of organisms that we care about, 
But one thing that has been understudied in, in ocean eDNA thus far are marine mollusks. Mollusks have been a great um, source of genetic information, especially looking at invasive species with eDNA. But if we look at just mollusks in the ocean, let's go back one, um, in 2006, they had the first molluscan eDNA study, not in the ocean, so using uh, eDNA as a non-invasive method to obtain DNA from freshwater mussels. Then in 2008, there was the first marine molluscan study where they found that foot mucus was a good source of genetic, informa uh, genetic information in polypocophora, which are chitons. And lastly, in 2015, um, scientists found that uh, they looked a little bit into the degradation of eDNA from freshwater uh, pearl mussels. So here we are in 2020, looking at the first study on abalone, limpet, and mussel eDNA. But before I jump into the, what that means and what those implications are, I wanted to go over some of the problems that we've had in molluscan eDNA research thus far. In the 2006 study, they found high variability between similar replicates. So the amount of eDNA that they were pulling off of organisms wasn't consistent even with similar sampling techniques. In 2008, the scientists were able to uh, amplify a non-target contaminant from the boulder. Uh, around the animal, suggesting that the primers that they used weren't necessarily species specific and they may have been picking up a contaminant rather than the actual chitin DNA. And lastly, even though the study looked at, um, at the degradation of eDNA, they didn't actually take a measurement. They just said, oh, probably degraded. And they found, um, also they found DNA from a uh, population of mussels that they thought to be extinct. So their methods were just a little bit, uh, could, could use some, some refining. So hopefully my study today can address some of these holes. So if you made it this far, you might be asking, okay, like I think I know what a mollusk is, but I'm gonna show you a few examples of what a mollusk is. So if you're from the central coast of California, you're probably very familiar with the banana slug, but there are a lot of mollusks in the ocean as well. Uh, some of them you've probably eaten in seafood dishes before, things like bivalves, those organisms that have two shells, such as scallops and mussels. And also the gastropods, some of my favorites, like sea slugs, limpets, and snails. And another really important uh, class of mollusks are the cephalopods, things like cuttlefish, squid, nautilus, and octopuses. So you understand now that in the literature, there isn't a ton on marine mollusks, and what there is could really use some building up. But of all the things I could study, why would I study mollusks? Well, I love mollusks. I have loved mollusks ever since I was in elementary school where I had pet snails. Um, so this is a picture of my best friend and I. I'm holding a snail. We obviously have our protective gear on there, our robes and my goggles to keep my eyes safe. Um, and I'm holding a baby snail in my hand. I had pet snails and learned all about their reproductive cycles. I learned what a hermaphrodite was in second grade. Um, and it was just a really amazing experience for me to get hands-on in science and learn about mollusks. The cool thing is that this thesis kind of brings my research full circle. Um, and the best part about it is I didn't necessarily have to kill any animals to do this research. Like I mentioned, the eDNA is non-invasive, which is good because when one of my snails died back then, we held a full-on funeral for it. Um, so we didn't have to do that for this thesis, which is great. But I'm not the only one who cares about mollusks. In fact, they're very ecologically important. They serve as food sources for sea stars, sea otters, all the things that we love to see in our tide pools locally. And they are commercially valuable. You probably also like to eat mollusks. Um, one of those examples are abalone. And abalone have had kind of a troubled past on our coast. Um, here is a quote from Laura Rogers Bennett et al. in 2002. In 1903, a Japanese hard hat diver in the Mendocino area in Northern California could collect an average of 2,300 red abalone in six hours. Almost 100 years later, only 406 red abalone were found in the same area in 326 minutes. So overall, one diver could collect 2,300 abalone in a day. There were multiple divers out and they would go out multiple days a week. So this led to pretty much a total collapse of the abalone fishery, red abalone fishery off of our coasts early on. And abalone are a long lived species. They can live upwards of 50 years and it takes them about five years to become sexually reproductive. So this isn't a species that necessarily bounces back well from something as catastrophic as this. But we have other species of abalone on our coast that were also fished almost to extinction. And in the late 1980s, they were also hit with a disease. This is a graph showing uh, black abalone populations off of the uh, Channel Islands, which is off of Southern California. You'll notice that in the mid 80s, their populations were fairly high. 
but when withering foot disease, a disease that killed black and white abalone on our coasts came through in the late 1980s, their populations declined and have not since recovered. So this is a species of concern in California and something I think we could really apply eDNA research to in order to learn more about how we can protect these organisms. So with that being said, I decided to pick three different organisms to look at the differences in body shape um, and how that might affect the eDNA put off. So first is the California blue mussel, Middleus californianus. This animal is a bivalve, so again, that means it has two shells. It's a filter feeder. They live in the low to mid intertidal, and they're very common. They're not a species that we're concerned about at this time. The second is the red abalone, Haliotis rufescens, which is a gastropod and a grazer. And like I mentioned, they are threatened due to overharvesting. Also currently, they're only available at abalone farms or aquaculture facilities due to a mass mortality event last winter when we had the big storms. Um, so the recreational fishery in this area is closed until 2021. Last is the rough limpet, Laudia scabra, which is a gastropod and a grazer. They eat microalgae on rocks and they are related to threatened limpets. The Laudia scabra itself is not threatened. The owl limpet is threatened due to overharvesting. So the question that I came into this research with was what is eDNA really trying to tell us, especially when it comes to these mollusks? I'm showing you some of the downfalls in the literature thus far, and I really wanted to focus in on these three species to see what the eDNA is trying to tell us. And I did that through three hypotheses. The first is that larger animals will release more eDNA than smaller animals within a species. The second is that activity level will increase the amount of eDNA each individual puts off. And the third is that eDNA accumulated in the water from live organisms will decrease over time with greater UV, heat, and bacterial level. So now let's go over the methods that I use to test these hypotheses. So first I wanna take you through the three methods that I used in all of my experiments. This is kind of the background to molecular biology that you need um, to get you through the rest of the experiments. So starting off with water filtration, this is how I would collect the eDNA from the water. So we would start with a fixed volume of water with the animal in it and DNA itself is actually negatively charged in general. So we can use that to our advantage in collection. We would uh, suck up a known volume in a syringe and filter it through a positively charged GFF filter. This filter would not only capture free floating DNA, but it has small holes in it. So it could also collect any cellular material or debris that may be in the water as well. Then we were left with a filter that had all the DNA and poop and everything that we wanted to collect on it. And we could move that filter into the DNA extraction process. One thing I do wanna mention before moving on is every time we did a filtration, we would new, use new gloves on a bleach cleaned surface uh, with fully autoclave and bleach cleaned materials that we could reduce the risk of contamination between samples. Moving into DNA extraction, I used the Kyogen DNA Z blood and tissue kit and followed the manufacturer's recommendations for all of the extraction steps, except the last step where you collect DNA in a final volume. Uh, eDNA generally exists in pretty low levels in the water. So I used a smaller volume for that last step to collect the DNA so that my DNA was slightly more concentrated. Last, uh, the last thing that I used in all of my experiments is qPCR. This takes a little bit more explanation, so we're gonna go through it in a few different slides. So first, PCR is polymerase chain reaction. The goal of a polymerase chain reaction is to make as many copies of your target DNA sequence as you can. So you start by adding in DNA, primers, and a polymerase into a tube, and you place it into a thermal cycler, which is going to take it through a series of heating and cooling reactions. Those reactions lead the DNA through three steps, denaturation, annealing, and elongation. During denaturation, the double helix melts apart and you are left with two distinct pieces of DNA. During annealing, your primers, which again are those small pieces of uh, DNA, are gonna bind to your single-stranded DNA and then during elongation, those primers are going to lengthen into fully complementary pieces of DNA. So you're left with twice as much DNA as you started with. Overall, the DNA concentration will increase exponentially until you start to run out of reagents in the tube. So for qPCR, which is a step up quantitative PCR, we wanna quantify the DNA concentration based on how the DNA copies, but it's a very similar process. We start with DNA, primers, a polymerase, we also add in a fluorescent dye. The purpose of that fluorescent dye is to send a signal to our slightly smarter thermal cycler every time we create new double-stranded DNA. So we do similar steps, but when we create that uh, double-stranded DNA, we send off a fluorescent signal. 
The other thing that we have in our qPCR machine at the same time as our unknowns that we're trying to quantify are some known standards. Those known standards are going to uh, amplify and our computer in the thermal cycler is going to calculate a crossing threshold. A lower crossing threshold means that there's higher DNA concentration. The crossing threshold is the point at which the background fluorescence, or sorry, is the point at which the fluorescence coming from that sample overcomes the background fluorescence. There might be background fluorescence for a few different reasons, but it's kind of in a swimming pool with fluorescent materials and, and genetic materials, and so there is likely to be some uh, errant background fluorescence. And then once we have that uh, crossing threshold for each of our unknowns, we also have a crossing threshold for our unknown standards, and we can create a, a standard curve with which to back calculate the starting concentrations of our unknown samples. All right, so that is, those are the basic uh, methods that I used in each of my experiments. Now let's go through the actual experiments. I broke them into two sections. The first is eDNA accumulation. The second is eDNA degradation. So for accumulation, um, I had that eDNA accumulates in 24 hours. That was the first experiment with animals closed in a jar with a bubbler. Then I also had eDNA accumulation with differing behaviors where I had animals acting normally versus animals that were forced to expose their soft tissue. And lastly, for eDNA degradation, I had a multiple stressor experiment where I had three levels of UV, two temperatures, and two bacterial levels. So each of those experiments also correlates with one of my different hypotheses. The hypothesis will always be at the top of the slide because I'm sure you don't remember what hypothesis one is anymore, but I'll remind you and we'll all stay together. So for experiment one, which is addressing the hypothesis that larger animals will release more eDNA than smaller animals within a species, I started by measuring, weighing, and photographing each animal. I then placed each animal in its own labeled jar and turned on a bleach clean bubbler set to low, just enough to give them oxygen, but not enough so it was like a big hot tub and they were, you know, the water was coming out and boiling over. Um, then after 24 hours, we removed the bubbler and inverted the jar three times in order to suspend any particulate matter that may have fallen to the bottom of the jar and filtered 15 milliliters through a GFF filter over 45 seconds. Then we extracted the DNA, quantified the DNA using qPCR, and analyzed the DNA concentrations using a two-way ANOVA. For experiment two, which is addressing the hypothesis that act uh, activity level will increase the amount of eDNA each individual puts off, I started by again measuring, weighing, and photographing each animal. Then I placed each animal in a bleach cleaned beaker for two hours and let it do its natural thing. Then I filtered 15 milliliters of water, put the animal back in a new bleach cleaned container with water, but this time the animals were under different treatments. For example, limpets and abalone were placed upside down and mussels were forced to stay open. Now, limpets will stay upside down just fine, but the abalone and mussels needed a little bit of coercion. Um, you'll see what I did to the mussels in just a second, but for abalone, I placed circles of Velcro on their backs to force them to stay upside down for the two hours. But no abalone were harmed in the making of this experiment. Everyone was fine at the end. Lastly, I then repeated the water filtration after two hours, extracted the DNA and quantified the concentrations, and analyzed the DNA concentration using a paired t-test. So I'm going to show you now some time-lapse videos of this actual experiment because I find them very interesting. So starting with the mussels. So I place each of the mussels in their individual containers. And you'll notice that for some of the individuals, their foot actually pops out. Um, so they are alive. They're thriving, doing well, very active. And I'm going to skip to about the halfway. Oh, maybe I won't. Well, we'll just watch through. And after a while, I'm going to take the mussels out of their containers and place a metal rod between the two valves of their shells. This didn't hurt them in any way. It wasn't any, uh, they weren't opened any more than they would be naturally, but it forced them to stay open. So there you can see the metal rod between their two valves. And you will notice after a while that some of the mussels spit out the metal rod because they did not want it there. So I did um, write that down when that occurred and took that into consideration for my statistics. Next, moving on to abalone. So again, abalone, I had to um, place a, a circle of Velcro on their backs. So overall, they're moving around. Abalone are super active um, and they 
wanted to get out of the tanks. <laughs> and then at the halfway point again, which it's not gonna let me go to, so I'm gonna take a sip of tea before moving on. All right, so at the halfway point, I'm going to take them out of these containers, filter 15 milliliters of water, put them back in to a new container that has the complementary piece of Velcro on the bottom. So now you can see they're moving around quite a bit. Again, a few of them do escape treatment, which is something that I noted in my, um, when I do my statistics, but you'll see they're pretty active with their foot moving around there. So they were not enjoying that very much. But like I said, no animals harmed in the making of this experiment. Last are the limpets. And if you've never actually seen a limpet move, because I'm sure a lot of people haven't, they're not very active creatures. Um, here you go. <laughs> I actually sped up this video twice as fast as the other two so that you could actually see something happening. Um, so the limpets do move and then I'm going to flip them over. But again, they didn't need any help flipping over. They stayed upside down on their own and did not attempt to write. All right. So now moving on to experiment three, which is addressing the hypothesis that eDNA accumulated in the water from live organisms will decrease over time with greater UV, heat, and bacterial level. I started by extracting stock DNA from each of the target species. The reason I did this is because I had over 100 replicates and I wanted to make sure that the DNA I was putting in each of them came from the same organisms and was the same concentration. So I made about 30 milliliters of DNA stock so that I could just pipette it easily into each of the uh, reactions. I then filtered, autoclaved, and added antibiotics to half of the water. The other half of the water was just out of the aquarium room at Moss Lightning Marine Laboratories and had ambient amounts of bacteria. I then aliquoted that water and that DNA equally into each well of a six well plate and placed those plates in their respective treatment locations. So we've already gotten at the bacterial uh, aspect of this study. Now we need to get at the temperature and UV. So the first temperature was at 20 degrees Celsius in the aquarium room at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. And I placed all of the samples underneath a UV heat lamp, like you might find in a reptile cage to get at the different UV treatments. So I placed the plates on top of a shelf, on the bottom of a shelf, and in a box for high, low, and no UV. Then in the cold room at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, which is 10 degrees C, I did the same thing. So on top of a locker shelf, bottom of a locker shelf, and in a box. Then I sampled at 2, 4, 8, 12, 24, 48 hours, and then every other day until 21 days, which means that I slept in the lab. And as a side note to this, this was happening around the 30th anniversary of the earthquake that destroyed our school, the Loma Prieta earthquake. And we were having a cluster of earthquakes at this time. So I actually texted a friend and was like, if the building collapses, please come in and save me. Uh, but I picked the most earthquake safe place in our lab to sleep right underneath the QPCR machine and away from all of the refrigerators. Then I extracted the DNA, quantified the DNA and analyzed it using a randomized block ANOVA. All right, oops, let's go back just a slide. Okay, so now we're gonna go into results. I'll walk you through each of the graphs on the slides um, and I will show you what we found. So overall, starting with experiment one, which is addressing the hypothesis that larger animals will release more eDNA than smaller animals within a species. First, I wanna show you overall what happened in this experiment. So on the x-axis, we have eDNA in nanograms per microliter per gram. So a normal way that we express DNA concentration is in nanograms per microliter, so a weight per a volume, a density. Um, but I also normalize this data, in this case, by the wet weight of the animal. So that's what that extra gram is. Then on the y-axis, we have the different organisms. Overall, I found that abalone put off more eDNA per weight than the other two species. But actually addressing the hypothesis and getting into the individual um, species, X-axis here, we have the different sizes of the organisms. So within each species, I broke them up into small, medium, and large organisms. The controls on this graph are the aquarium room seawater. So I just made sure that there was no incoming muscle DNA in the actual seawater coming into the aquarium room. And an extraction control, which is just a blank extraction to make sure that I wasn't making any mistakes by contaminating anything during the experiment. And on the y-axis, we have the eDNA concentration, again, in nanograms per microliter. So for mussels, there was no difference in eDNA put off uh, based on their size classes. Same graph here for limpets. One thing I do wanna point out though, we'll just go back a slide, is the maximum on the muscle graph for eDNA concentration is 0.1. 
for limpets, we're down to 0 0.008 is our maximum. So they put off a lot less eDNA, which is why that control box looks a little bit bigger. Um, the controls were significantly different from the limpets, but in general, no difference in eDNA put off based on the size class for the limpets. And lastly, for abalone, uh, again, note the different scales. So now we're up to about double what we got for the mussels. And overall, small abalone put off less eDNA than medium and large abalone. All right, so overall, species emanation rates are different, and size doesn't necessarily relate to the emanation rate. Moving on to experiment two, which is addressing the hypothesis that activity level will increase the amount of eDNA each individual puts off. Uh, so on the x-axis, we have the three different organisms, abalone, mussel, and limpet. And then we have first their uh, soft tissue exposed treatment, so inverted, open, inverted. And then the second bar is them in their natural state. Overall, abalone put off more eDNA when inverted than when they are righted. Uh, but this trend did not continue for mussels and limpets despite their treatment. And it's a little bit hard to see here. So the next graph, I'm just gonna zoom in on mussels and limpets so you don't have to worry about the abalone. Um, so again, no difference in shedding rate uh, for mussels and limpets when they were open versus closed or inverted versus righted. So overall, abalone exude a lot of eDNA, especially when their soft tissue is exposed. Limpets and mussels were not affected by either treatment. So moving on to experiment three, which is addressing the hypothesis that eDNA over time will degrade um, when exposed to UV, heat, and bacterial level. Uh, on the x-axis of this graph here, we have days since the addition of eDNA, the initial addition. And then on the y-axis, again, we have eDNA and nanograms per microliter. Each of these colors on the graph represents a different treatment. So maybe it's at 10 degrees, high UV, uh, no bacteria. It doesn't really matter what the colors are in this case because I'm going to show you on the next slide this graph um, where each of these lines are on their own individual graph. But I do wanna make a point here with this graph. And the first is that most of the eDNA degradation occurred in the first 24 hours. So if we look at day one, um, that is where most of the eDNA degradation occurred by. But this experiment, I only had one replicate per sample. So you'll notice that there is high variability. In the limpet, we do have some unexpected peaks. We would expect pretty much exponential decay. So it, we would expect things to go down kind of in an L shape, and we do have several peaks here. It gets slightly worse with abalone and mussels. So for abalone, a little bit more variation, and mussels even more so. When I show you these graphs by themselves, it looks slightly less like spaghetti, but we're coming up with an explanation for this and think we're onto something pretty cool. Um, so let's keep moving forward. So first, this is the exact same graph that I showed you from the limpets before, but rather than having the different colored lines, I now have all of the dots separated onto their own uh, individual plot. So I'm gonna walk you through the organization of this, and this organization will stay the same for abalone and mussels as well. So on the top, we have all of the high UV samples. Then we have low UV, no UV. Then we have no bacteria and ambient bacteria, 20 degrees, 10 degrees. So all of the uh, future graphs will be uh, organized like that. And if one of those factors has uh, some significance to eDNA degradation, I'll highlight it again so that you know what we're looking at. Um, so overall for limpets, elapsed time was actually the only thing that affected eDNA breakdown over the first three days. UV, heat, and bacteria did not have a statistical influence on the eDNA breakdown. For abalone, bacterial activity and elapsed time affected eDNA breakdown. So again, there's our no bacteria and our high bacteria there on the right. And lastly, for mussels, again, only elapsed time affected eDNA breakdown, not UV, heat, or bacteria. And this time we're looking at the first two days. So overall, elapsed time affected degradation in all three species. So over time, the DNA is going away. Um, and bacterial level did affect abalone eDNA degradation. But again, I wanna point out the high variability. And you'll notice that I only was able to analyze through day two or three. Um, again, that comes down to the unexplained variability in the measurement. But it also comes down to the fact that I couldn't fit all of the samples on the same qPCR plate. When I moved on to subsequent qPCR plates, the variability increased. So the long-term data couldn't be analyzed with these short-term data. So moving on to the discussion, 
Starting off, I'm gonna go through the three hypotheses. We'll see what I got right, what I didn't get right, um, and then we'll go through the rationale and kind of try to figure out what was going on. Um, so first, for hypothesis one, which again is that larger animals will release more eDNA than smaller animals within a species. For abalone, this was true, not for limpets and mussels. So small abalone put off more, e or sorry, put off less eDNA than medium and large abalone. This trend was not consistent for the other animals in the study. For hypothesis two, which is that activity level will increase the amount of eDNA each individual puts off. For abalone, again, true, not for limpets and mussels. So abalone that are forced to expose their soft tissue or are more active um, put off more eDNA. And lastly, for hypothesis three, which is that eDNA accumulated in the water from live organisms will decrease over time with greater UV, heat, and bacterial level. I think we need to go back to the drawing board on this and maybe reanalyze some samples once the lab opens up or look for some alternatives to see what really happened because I think that there's more to the picture here than this hypothesis was actually anticipating to find. Um, so starting off with hypothesis one, I think that the reason that we only found that abalone put off more eDNA per size um, is because of differences in body plan and metabolism. These animals, of course, look very different. And by the video you saw, the abalone were way more active than the limpets. So probably coming down to some metabolism stuff there. But in terms of body plan, here are some of the things that I think may have affected the overall eDNA output. The length of the digestive tract, the rate of cell turnover, and the rate of fecal production. I can say by word of mouth that abalone definitely pooped a lot more than limpets did, but I don't actually have the numbers to back that up. Also, it is important to note differences in primers because you know, the CO1 region is really great because it can tell the difference between closely related species, but that also means that abalone CO1 is a different sequence than limpet CO1. And it's possible that one just amplifies a little bit better or, you know, something like that. So it's just important to take into consideration that the primers may have also caused a bias here. Moving on to hypothesis two, again, that activity level will increase the amount of eDNA each individual puts off. It is important to note again that some of the abalone and mussels escape treatment. When I did the statistics, I removed those individuals and kept them in to see if there was any difference, and there wasn't. So I ended up keeping them in the final statistics. Overall, the limpets were really inactive, not only in this study, but just in general in the tank. They did not attempt to write themselves, and if they ever fell off the wall in the aquarium room, if I didn't catch it in time, they would die. I think that this might, uh, suggests that maybe these limpets weren't happy being in captivity, um, but also that might just be a characteristic of limpets, but the, this species of limpet in particular is kind of an upper inner tidal species, um, and they're used to being out of water the majority of the day, and our aquarium room setup at Moss Landing doesn't allow for that to happen, so it's possible that the limpets were just not in the best conditions for themselves. Lastly, I really quickly want to address, um, you know, you might be looking at this uh, experimental setup and looking at the word activity and be like, well, I don't know if you're really getting at activity. I just briefly, there were a lot of things that I tried to just get at activity. For example, I wanted to just put in food to make the organisms more active. Um, but all of these things eat algae or microalgae, which inhibits DNA extraction. So putting in food wasn't going to work. I also tried adding in a predator, um, but the animal behavior was just really variable. Um, and so the best way to get at a consistent result was to modify their natural behavior. But lastly, again, this is the first study of this nature. So I think that there's a lot we can build on this and that's pretty cool. So lastly, moving on to hypothesis three, um, which again is looking at how uh, eDNA will degrade over time with greater UV heat and bacterial level. Again, it's important to note that the experiment continued on for 21 days but qPCR plates can only hold up to 77 samples when we have our known standards in the plate as well. So I um, was unable to run all of the samples on the same plate. I had over 100 samples per species, and there was a noticeable spike in DNA concentration on the second plate, even though I used the same primers. So that's something that we hope to revisit when the lab opens up again. There was also just this unexplained variation in the data, and that could come down to instrument sensitivity, instrument error possibly, or processing error. Because there was only re one replicate per each of these, if I pipetted anything wrong, it would definitely reflect as an error in the measurements. But something that John and I have been working on fairly recently actually, is looking at the nature of degraded eDNA 
and how that might actually be affecting our overall results. Our assumption is that degraded eDNA can't react. So if there's degraded DNA, eDNA in the sample, we won't see it because we're not amplifying the CO1 region of the genome. We're not creating that double-stranded DNA, and so we won't show anything on our qPCR. Or if we do, whatever we're seeing on our qPCR, we assume to be our CO1 sequence of the genome. So we calculate the crossing threshold, which is just based on fluorescence, but any double-stranded DNA could potentially be putting off the fluorescent signal. Um, so one thing that we can look at that I haven't mentioned yet is a melting curve. The purpose of a melting curve is to kind of get a glimpse into the length and the sequence of what you are looking at. For example, some parts, you know, if we're looking at uh, some sequences will melt at similar temperatures. So if we have a sequence that's much longer or much shorter, it might melt at a different temperature than something that is more similar. Um, but also sequence, G and C base pairs bind with three, um, bonds and A and T with two. So the melt curve can really tell us what the sequence is kind of looking like and how long it is. Here's kind of the ideal situation for a melting curve. So here we have two targets, uh, mussels, which are in blue, and abalone, which are in green. You'll notice that there are two distinct peaks here. So all of the abalone melt at about the same temperature, and all of the mussels melt, again, at about the same temperature as all the mussels. But the CO1 for abalone and mussels are different, so they have different melting temperatures compared to one another. So again, our assumption is that degradation makes the eDNA inert, that it can't react. But what I'm actually finding in my samples is that older samples have varying melting temperatures. So if we look at the early degradation study, this is just up to day three, you'll notice that there is one pretty strong peak for a melting temperature, but there are several samples over to the left. In general, those samples over to the left are some of the older samples, so closer to day three that had been in the degradation study a little bit longer. When we take it even further out, so days three to 21, things get even more crazy. So the length and strength of these sequences is no longer fitting to just one peak, likely suggesting that we have targets that aren't the same length and aren't the CO1 that we're actually looking for. Potential causes for this could include primer dimer, which happens when either two primers come together to form a product or the primer folds over like a hairpin or concatenation of degraded fragments. So if there's a bunch of you know, fragments of DNA floating around in there, they could potentially come together to form double-stranded DNA. But for this reason, qPCR reactions with strong peaks, especially where we don't expect those strong peaks, cannot reliably be interpreted. So this is pretty new, something that we're still working through, but something that I find very interesting and I think it'll all be cool to look into it more. So now moving on to a different topic, I want to brush on some modeling and how this eDNA research might be able to be used in real life. So the goal was to investigate how much eDNA spreads out in the nearshore ecosystem, uh, specifically looking at diffusion, tides, and waves. To calculate diffusion, I modeled it like a random walk. So I generated a random number between zero and one and multiplied that by a random one or negative one so that the particle could go up or down in the water column. For tides, I modeled it as a sine wave with a period of a normal mixed semi-diurnal tide. And for waves, I modeled them with the average velocity with which water is transported in the direction of wave propagation, which is Stokes drift. And this uh, equation that we're about to use comes from Mark Denny. This is what that equation looks like. And to calculate it, we need wave height, wave length, wave number, depth. Surface is how I like to think about it, but it's really position in the water column, it's S and angular velocity. And I wanted to model it at two different time points so that we could really see some of the maximum movement that we might see in different seasons in Monterey Bay. So I first picked the summer, which has a shorter wavelength and smaller waves, and also the winter, where there is a longer wavelength and larger waves. And I actually picked real data from Monterey Bay. Um, so I picked data from this region right here, which is just south of Moss Landing, where some of the largest waves occur um, in the bay. So this is what the model is going to look like when I press play in a few slides, but I just wanted to orient you to the space so you can see this how I see it. Um, so first, let's start on the y-axis. We have height from the bottom, um, or depth, which is in meters. So the surface is up at the top. The bottom is at the bottom, so at zero. And then for the y-axis, or sorry, for the x-axis, um, we have distance traveled towards shore. 
So the beach is further away over here. That's where the beach is. The last thing I want to point out before moving on to the next slide is that on the bottom, you'll see this um, little tracker here. This is going to increment the model by one hour every time. So let's pretend like there's a pier piling offshore. And on that pier piling is an abalone. The abalone exists one meter below the surface of the water. Over time, that abalone is going to put off DNA at a constant rate, and that DNA is going to age as it moves. So lastly, over here, you'll see this column which represents age. So the more green or yellow the particle is, the older it is. And my degradation study showed that most of the eDNA degradation occurs in the first 24 hours. So the more green or yellow a particle is, probably the less likely it is to still exist in the model. So let's start off with showing you the data for the summer. So over time, the eDNA is being released by our abalone, our imaginary abalone at this point. And you'll notice it's actually moving quite, uh, quite far from where it started. We're now at 3K. Um, and so over time, the eDNA has the potential in the summer where waves are not as large to travel pretty far away from the actual target. Again, those particles are pretty yellow further away, so they are less likely to exist, um, but still a possibility. Now when we move to the winter time, things are about to get even crazier because now you'll notice on the x-axis that we go out to 35 kilometers. Now, I've never been to a beach in California where at a depth of 10 meters, you can walk 35 kilometers and not yet be on a beach. So likely what I think is happening here is if the organism is close enough into shore like this kind of calculation, the eDNA is likely actually accumulating in the near shore, in the swash zone, because California beaches are really steep and uh, you could not walk that far and not hit a beach. So overall, eDNA can likely spread very quickly in the towards shore direction and it likely accumulates in the near shore. But there are a lot of things that I would like to add into this model, um, sea breeze, a longshore current, and just the turbulent mixing of Monterey Bay. We have this amazingly large canyon just offshore, and that makes for some really interesting currents and water movement within our bay. Um, so I think that's just a really interesting feature to add into this model. There are other degradation factors that might be interesting to add in here. If I had found an effect of UV and heat on my eDNA degradation, I would have added it in. Um, but you might imagine that if a particle of DNA is further down in the water column, because UV attenuates with depth, that it would experience less UV and maybe have a chance of surviving a little bit longer. But also, if the DNA is uh, accumulating in the near shore, I think it would be interesting to talk about shear stress, um, because one of the methods that we use to extract DNA in the lab is shaking the DNA or sh shaking any cellular material with a bunch of rocks, and that's likely going to break up a lot of DNA if there's a lot of sand mixing in waves. So moving on to some conclusions, I started with this kind of roadmap to show you some of the downfalls of eDNA research with mollusks thus far. Let's see what we have cleared up. So for our study, uh, looking specifically at the 2006 study, which had high variability between similar replicates. We still had some pretty high variability, especially in the degradation study. Um, and that might be the nature of eDNA and how low concentrated it is. But I think that that's a place that we can grow in eDNA research. Um, looking at the 2008 study where they amplified a non-target non contaminant from a boulder, I found no contaminants in aquarium room seawater, um, but everything is different when you get out in nature. So I can't promise that these are 100% going to work in nature. It's something I'd be really interested to look at, but so far we seem to be doing pretty well with that. And then lastly, um, we actually measured eDNA degradation rates and this that I can tell is the first study um, of this nature. And so it will be a really great addition to overall future eDNA research. Overall, eDNA with molecular techniques can be used to detect the presence of abalone, mussels, and limpets. And I think with abalone, we might be able to get at either size, abundance, or activity because we saw an increase in DNA concentration with size and activity. But I think it would be hard at this point to say, oh, there are two abalone offshore, or there's one really active abalone offshore. It's, it's you know, difficult to uh, piece those apart. For mussels and limpets, I think we can just get presence at this point because they are not putting off a lot of eDNA. And then overall, eDNA breaks down really quickly 
sampling in the first 24 hours after the uh, emanation of the DNA is best. But luckily for me, mollusks don't move very fast or very far. Um, so they should be putting off eDNA in the same environment for, for quite some time. In general, I think it's really important to mention that eDNA shedding rates differ and we need more experiments on specific species. It's impossible to, to distinguish between body size from activity from abundance at this point. And a lot of metagenetic studies are trying to get at abundances of organisms based on the amount of DNA that they're finding. And I don't know that we're 100% there yet. I think we need to do a lot more species specific studies before we can make those kind of conclusions. For future studies specifically related to my study, I'd love to have more replicates, wouldn't we all? Um, I would also love to randomize the samples on the qPCR plates. Um, I'm the kind of person where if I have samples, I wanna get them done. But looking back, it may have been better to put sample at hour number four next to day 21 to get at that more long-term data rather than trying to get at the shorter term data. Also, I'd love to do some more fluorescence microscopy to see where eDNA is coming from, if it's inside of cells, if it's in mucus, if it's in poop, where is it? I'd love to test the primers in the field. I actually have an idea in my head that I would love to kayak around one of our local abalone farms and see how far away I could detect eDNA. And lastly, I think that there is an awesome place here for citizen science. Um, you know, abalone diving is such a rich tradition in our area and I think it's something that a lot of families do. And so to be able to help the abalone population out in anything, in any way that we can would really be valuable. And it's so easy to go out and just collect a water sample. So I think that there's a huge place here for citizen science. Lastly, in terms of um, overall overarching future study and general applicability of what, what I came up with, um, first I designed species specific primers for abalone mussels and limpets, and those will be available with my thesis. So if anybody wants to continue on with research, that's awesome. I also developed what will be an open source model for eDNA movement in the near shore ecosystem. I've shown the importance of replicates, which I think a lot of other studies have too. And lastly, and most importantly, I showed interspecies variation in eDNA shedding rates, even when compared to closely related species. So with that, I would like to thank all of these people. Um, I'll try to keep it brief, but first, of course, I have to thank John. Thank you so much for accepting me into your lab, um, thinking that I'm really enthusiastic even when we have lab meetings at 10 a.m. on a Monday morning, um, and just all your support, not only physically but financially as well during my time at Moss Landing. Just thank you so much. Um, of course, my thesis committee, Dr. Amanda Kahn and Tom Connolly. Um, both of these scientists have really influenced my time here at Moss Landing. Tom was one of my teachers my first semester here and showed me how cool physical oceanography was when we went out and launched pumpkins into the ocean. So that got me really excited about particle movement. Um, and of course, Amanda, for just being a cheerleader and somebody who I could go to on the worst of days and just have so much energy and so much positivity. Um, I wasn't sure I was gonna tell this story, but right the day that we found out lab was closing and that my thesis defense was going to be online amanda stopped me in the hallway and was like hi how are you and i immediately burst into tears <laughs> and that's not normal that doesn't happen normally but just your positive energy is such a wonderful thing and we really appreciate it around lab so thank you for your support um, of course my lab technicians melinda and martin who taught me almost every laboratory technique i know um, who were not only physical supports for help in the lab, but also were the kind of people that I could go to if I had questions or concerns or if I was having a bad day. Um, Melinda and Martin are just incredible and such wonderful assets to the Moss Landing community. Um, Tara, I think her name in all caps there tells you how important she is, but Tara is like our mom here at Moss Landing. If anything is ever wrong, we can go to her. She knows every form, she knows every person and is just an incredible resource for Moss Landing students. And I definitely could not have made it this far without Tara and her help. Of course, my lab mates, Emmett, Amanda, and Felicia, not only for coming to practice talks, but also for just being really amazing people to hang out with in lab. Um, I always would run into Emmett at strange times because I would leave lab at 9 p.m. on Friday night. Emmett would just be getting in and then when I would get in at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning, Emmett would just be leaving. So we had very different schedules, but y'all are all wonderful scientists. And I'm excited to see where you go. Of course, my UROC student, David, and intern, Maxwell, who helped out with some of my research. 
um, Nilo, Sean, and Nick from the Biological Oceanography Lab for helping me with flow cytometry and just being wonderful people to talk to in general. Um, all of the faculty and staff at Moss Landing, especially all the ladies who work in the front office, the shop guys, the library, IT, you guys are the lifeblood of Moss Landing. Without you, we would not be safe and we would not know what we are doing and we could not find any resources. So thank you so much to all of you for just keeping this place running and, and always doing it with a smile on your face. Um, all of my friends at Moss Landing, especially, you know, Vivian, Marty, Mia, Cindy, Taylor, AC, but everyone. I mean, I have so many friends in these pictures and being a student body president and working really um, strongly in this community has built such a wonderful group of friends around me. And so thank you so much. And thank you for going to my thesis, uh, practice thesis defenses as well. All of my friends, coworkers, and volunteers at the Exploration Center, um, y'all came into my life. Like, I think that there's something to be said, you know, graduate school is so challenging for people and you can start to fall out of love with science sometimes when your experiments aren't working and when everything is terrible, but working with, you know, the, the, the volunteers at the Exploration Center and the kids, like, they just brought so much life back into me as a scientist and I can't thank you all enough. Of course, my family at church, my Pepperdine University faculty and staff, and lastly, my actual family and my boyfriend, Stephen, who <laughs> some days dragged me kicking and screaming through graduate school, but I'm just so thankful for all of their support. Um, and the last, I wanna show you two more pictures. Um, the first, this is my graduation at Pepperdine and the Moss Landing graduation or thesis defense has been great. Um, but if we could do this ocean view thing again, that would be good with no more coronavirus so we can all hug again, that would be fun. Um, and then lastly, just before I take questions, I wanted to thank my funding sources and also show you this picture that I took the night that I slept over at lab. Um, Moss Landing is a, a funny place because you can get so ingrained in your project and so focused and so like sometimes you come out and you're so frustrated and then you look over the ocean and this is the view that you're greeted with and it's just incredible how this can lower your blood pressure so much and suddenly you remember again why you wanted to be a scientist and why you wanted to study marine science um so with that i will take any questions that anybody has Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm um, going to stop sharing my screen so you can see me for just a second, um, possibly, but, okay, hello everybody. Um, so I will take um, uh, like audio questions first, so if anybody has questions, um, use the raise hand function in the participants screen and hopefully I'll be able to see those. There we go. I don't see any raised hands. So, There's a couple oh, of questions in the chat. Yeah, there are. Um, I see that Jason Smith has a question. Yeah. Hi, Emily. Wonderful. Hi. Absolutely wonderful Thank presentation. <laughs> Good way to break up this tedium. Uh, I had a question about the uh, var variability because I think that's a common observation with, you know, it, been up to the Davis Symposium and trying to track rare fish, et cetera. But uh, are, do you believe that that is, might reflect the nature of the DNA that's coming out of the organisms? Are they releasing big clumps of snot or cells that you're, cap, you know, differentially that you're capturing? That's a good question. And I think it comes down to the activity level of the animal um, in general. You know, my, my studies, I guess, were a little bit biased because it was either a two hour time period or a 24 hour time period. So the animals didn't really have time to rest. But if the animal is constantly moving and constantly doing all the biological functions, I would imagine it's fairly um, consistent. But, you know, I have touched snails before and a huge like clump of mucus comes off. Um, I think right now we just don't know exactly where that eDNA is coming from and where the majority of it is coming from. Um, so I think that's a really good question. And I would say it really varies between species, um, what kinds of things that they're putting off and how much DNA is in them. And just to follow up on that, I wasn't, uh, now I'm not certain I, how I saw it, but uh, you did your DNA degradation studies with uh, uh, 
purified DNA species on a species basis. But do you think uh, the natural eDNA source prior to purification would exhibit similar decay kinetics or possibly it would last even longer? That's a good question. Um, so even though, so I did extract the DNA, but it wasn't just the CO1 region of the genome that right. I put into those samples. So based on, you know, and we can't say that we get the entire genome necessarily in the extraction process, um, but I did take it from actual tissues of animals. And unless there was some sort of bias, I believe that what I was actually pipetting into those individual reactions was representative of the genome. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope that I'm answering your question correctly. Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking more of just the, the physical, physical packaging of the, e, you know, eDNA, you know, you can, you can be a phytoplankton cell and still be captured on an eDNA particle. You could be, you know, a clump of lymphocytes that are being exudated or whatever, or you could be a naked piece of DNA. So I was just thinking maybe if you re ever do redo these types of experiments is to use the natural egg exudates and track that way just to see if it would be, uh, I think it would lengthen the time course a bit. Yeah, that's possible. That's definitely yeah. possible. And if you bring Ellie, your dog, then we can, uh -huh. we can do those experiments. So On the other know. hand, your results as is, is really nice because if you're tracking or searching for sources, you don't want it hanging around for long. So, I mean, it's a nice feature if it holds up that it is that short lived. Yeah, definitely. If you're tracking a blue whale, you don't want to see the signal of it two weeks later because the whale is long gone by then. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely a cool tool for sure. Cool. Well, thank you and congrats. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Katie, I see you have a question. Katie Siri. Hey, Emily. Uh, congrats. Such a great talk. Uh, good to see um, Ben is here with me and he just had a question. So I'll turn it over to him. All right. Hello, nice talk. I, it's actually the first time I'd really heard about environmental DNA. Really cool concept. Um, I was just wondering about how you were conducting your UV degradation studies, and maybe I missed it, but what was the exact difference between high and low UV exposure? Were you changing the wavelength or the intensity, or I guess how exactly was that experiment set up? Yeah, that's a good question. So I had the plates at two different heights and then in a box for no UV. Um, so that blocked out all UV. But for the different heights, I had, um, they were about 12 inches apart underneath the same light source. Um, so when I measured it with an actual like UV measure, um, I believe that it was like 60, oh, now I'm gonna forget the units, but it's like kilojoules. Well, it was, it was 60 and 20 and the maximum daily is up to 250. Um, but that's like, that's a lot of UV um, okay. with these units. And I apologize that I don't have the units off of my head. It's big and long. Um, so that's how I set it up. Um, so overall, it was just the distance between them rather than different wavelengths or different, um, even different lights. It was the same light. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think that's all of those questions. Um, I have some questions in the chat. Um, mostly from my family. Um, so from my sister and her husband, um, do you envision eDNA will be a future benchmark for the health of nearshore ecosystems? That's a really great question. Um, I think once we get a grasp on especially the abundance numbers, yeah, it could definitely say something about the health of nearshore ecosystems based on how rich the community is and what kind of food sources are available to support that community. Um, yeah, so I think, I think that there is a place for that. I think it'll be complicated because um, of how many invasive species we have all over the world and just the complexity of eDNA and, and degradation rates. And, um, but yes, I think that there is a possibility for that. And then from my niece who is two years old, what is your favorite mollusk? Um, <laughs> I think my favorite mollusk has to be a sea slug called the sea lemon. And it was in the picture or on the slide that showed what the different uh, mollusks look like. It was that big yellow sea slug on the bottom. So I think that's my favorite. Any other questions? Awesome. It doesn't look like it. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today to my thesis defense. Um, I'm very honored that all of you came. And um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me 
Um, but other than that, have a great night and uh, stay healthy.